Leafs Converts, TLC OGs, hockey fans, what is up? This is the Leafs Convo Podcast. I'm Norman James, your host. So nice to be with you. How do you listen to us, by the way? Let me know. It's a new week for the Leafs, a new week for the pod, and there are new developments surrounding the club that we'd like to dive into. Although I know someone with some outstanding lingering issues with the team that he won't let go of. They're important, so we'll hear them out. What do you say? Let's pod. The Leafs Convo starts right now. And we are joined now by Michael P. Ajello. Hello, Mike. How are you? Good afternoon, Norman. Uh, I am well. Uh, how are you doing? Not too bad. Still trying to figure out what the Maple Leafs are. Are they superior to the Boston Bruins, or are they going to be inferior until they finally beat them in a playoff series? Because it doesn't seem like they can get the upper hand during the regular season. You know, I, I, I'm trying to be careful and not read too much into one regular season game, but... You know, after, you know, we, we know that they're more than likely going to play Boston in the first round. So that that increases the you know emphasis on Saturday's game and the two games in Boston that were basically train wrecks. So you looked at this game on Saturday, the three two loss, and you try to maybe draw some conclusions from it, but not too many conclusions are not things that you know will rule out the the Leafs being able to beat them in a seven game series now you know anything is possible you know if Freddie Anderson stands on his head if they get you know Matthews and Marner are going great guns and they can't be controlled in Toronto uh, has a puncher's chance of beating Boston but I think that the game on Saturday sort of illustrated that one team is deeper more experienced and probably more talented in the right areas uh, than, than the other. And, uh, you know, with Michael Hutchinson and that people wanted to use that as an excuse, I didn't think he was at fault for any of the three goals. Uh, I think it was the defense that really led to those three goals and the Leafs didn't score enough, but I, I, you know, I, I think there are a couple areas from that game that you can carry forward and that need to be addressed by Kyle Dubas before February 25th. Marlowe hasn't done much. Kadri, what, one goal in 17 games. Nylander still hasn't found his sea legs. Austin Matthews has gone cold. You know, if these guys are firing on all cylinders, it doesn't matter what the Bruins bring. The Leafs are going to, you know, counter with plenty of offense, which they don't seem to have right now. So while we lament the defense and we're worried about the goaltending situation, the Leafs' number one characteristic, they're not really playing to that level right now, and that should be concerning as well. I mean, let's click them off one at a time. I mean, Nealander we've talked about, so we don't need to really go down that road. And the funny thing is, I think that that line, Marlowe, Kadri, Nealander, in the first period was the most dangerous line on the ice. They had a number of chances. Nealander was really quick. He had a really good scoring chance. Um, I think he created um, a... Uh, turnover from a Bruins defenseman that led to a penalty in the first period, but it was, you know, he was, that line was on, but they didn't get rewarded for it. And then in the second period, they were chiefly responsible along with the, the great defensive pairing of Jake Gardner and Nikita Zaitsev for the, the, the tying and the game winning goal. So it, it reversed quickly. Marlowe has been yo-yoed back and forth between different lines. That does not help in terms of consistency. Kadri, the only time he scored this year was when Matthews was out and was getting more ice time. So that that that's strange. Nylander, again, you know, he's struggling to get back. And Matthews, I mean, he was at a goal per game pace. So, I mean, you, to expect that to go out throughout the year is just not realistic. But it, it, again, going back to the game, I think that the keys and you look at, at the Leafs and you look at the Bruins and – you know, the key player for the Bruins on Saturday was Sean Corrali, who's a third or fourth line guy. And that line of Corrali, Chris Wagner, and Noel Archieri was a matchup problem for the Leafs. They could not match mm -hmm. up against that line. And and when you look at that line and you look at the ice time in terms of Bruce, Bruce Cassidy splitting up the ice time amongst uh, his players, the, the top line, uh, uh, Pasternak, Marchand, and Bergeron, I don't think any of them played more than 20 minutes. They played around 18 minutes and the lowest ice time was David Backus around 10 and a half. And most of the players averaged anywhere like 12 to 14 minutes. So it was, they rolled four lines basically and balanced mm -hmm. their attack. The Leafs, their fourth line was invisible 
uh, Power Lindholm and Freddie Gauthier played about eight, around eight minutes, and and Connor Brown got some penalty killing time, so he was around nine and a half. Mm-hmm. They need more of a contribution from the fourth line. I think that can be addressed internally with guys like Trevor Moore, mm-hmm. or if they call people up from the Marlies. But it might be something where those are there. There, that is where the heavier players that Mike Babcock is looking for will be acquired and placed uh, by Kyle Dubas. You need your support players to make the difference in those close games, especially when your top stars are struggling or checked or shadowed really intensely. So all of this is a test before the playoffs, Mike. So they did lose, but you know, the beat goes on in the long term. I mean, the only injury right now they have uh, is, is Tyler Ennis and he was, he really provided some energy and some speed and some skill on the fourth line. So they miss him and he's probably going to be out probably the rest of January, maybe into early February. So they're, they're going to be without that. But when he is back, there's got to be some changes to that, to that fourth line. They have to be more than just, uh, you know, the, uh, the odd shift here or there, they got to play 10, 11 minutes a night. They have to provide some energy. They have to make it a little bit more of a difference to take some of the pressure off of Tavares and Marner and those top lines, because eventually a team is going to be able to shut those players down. And like Boston, they got uh, production from guys you don't expect production from and that the Leafs will need at, at a key point. Are the Leafs built to showcase, but not, really win when the chips are on the table Mike I think they're I think they have the skill to win but I don't know whether the team as currently constructed and I wrote about this on uh yesterday is is strong in the right places to be able to win especially with the you know they're they're behind the eight ball when it comes to the first round of the playoffs they're either going to play Boston or Tampa it's playing one of the best teams in the league right off the bat they don't get the break of having to play a wild card team or playing a team in their division that's weak i mean Boston you know for lack of a better term has their number and Tampa is the best team in the NHL so you know if the playoff structure was different they'd be able they'd be playing the 7th ranked team in the east or some some lesser team that they'd have a better chance at but they really have to be on and have to be better when the middle of april comes around and the playoffs start and right now again and we haven't talked about it their defense mm-hmm. was exposed on saturday once again if it's not better i mm-hmm. don't think they're going to win unless against freddie anderson um you know channels his inner patrick wah I don't know how much of a psychological boost the Leafs are going to get from him being in that. The question is, how long can he stay healthy? And how much is he going to play down the line, knowing that they're going to need this guy to be fresh for the playoffs? Well, I think there's a sort of a security blanket aspect to Frederick Anderson. And to go back to like the, the cartoon Peanuts and Linus with his with his favorite blanket. I mean, I think that they, you know, that, that there is that aspect there. I mean, he's one of the best goalies in the league. He's definitely a Vesna tra- Trophy candidate based on the way he's played played but you know he's a guy that they're everybody's friendly with that they're comfortable with and that you know backs them up and I agree there was not a problem with Michael Hutchinson playing the five straight games that he did I thought he played well I thought he gave them a chance to win and that's all you can ask for from a backup or in this case a a third goaltender who you brought in for a fifth round pick and then had to play because of both goaltenders getting injured. I'm, I'm confident now that the Leafs, if Garrett Sparks declines or if he gets hurt again or if Freddie Anderson gets hurt, that they have a stop gap in, in Hutchinson that can, you know, at least go 500 and uh, until, you know, one, of the, one or the other gets back. So, but, but they, they need Frederick Anderson. They, we know that they need him playing at the top of his game right now. And that's, again, my problem is like, you cannot be wholly dependent on your goaltender being at the top of his game to be able to win. It's nice to have that as a little extra thing, Mm -hmm. but you need to be better and have, and not completely depend on your goaltender to save your bacon. From the YouTube community platform, Dean Johnston. What's wrong with Austin Matthews? Yes, everyone goes through a slump, but something is not right with him. Do you think that, Mike? No, I, I, I don't. I mean, it, it's funny. We expected him to sort of struggle coming back from the shoulder injury, and then he was scoring like crazy at a goal per game pace and continued to, it was like, I think it was 20 games, 20 goals. And it's like, okay, that's not going to stay. It's like, you know, 
who, who Wayne Gretzky scored 92 one year. That's the only one, or, you know, there, I think there was, it was one player that scored over 80, you know, Austin Matthews is a, is a supreme talent, but you cannot expect him to score at a goal per game pace. He's going to score 35 to 40 goals. And that means that sometimes he's going to struggle and, you know, he's had, long stretches of uh, not being able to score goals. I'm not concerned. He's still playing well. He's still setting up his line mates. You know, I mean, you'd like him to score more often right now, but look at it this way. If he, if he was scoring at a goal per game place, he'd be the highest paid player in the NHL next year on his new contract. And now, you know, maybe he won't be the highest paid player that there's a, there's a, a pot at the end of the rainbow in that respect. If the Leafs play a tight checking close knit game, one goal game with the Bruins, in the playoffs, I don't think they're going to prevail in that series. Teams now are drawing up new game plans to contend with all of the Leafs' firepower. Yeah, and one of the things they changed was their power play. They took Matthews off the number one unit, put him down on the second unit, which made the second unit stronger, and put Kasper Kapanen in and that you know, the first power play uh, unit converted on, I think, one of two chances in, against Boston with Marner's goal. So, you know, they, they they need their special teams to be the way they were earlier in the year. Teams adjust. They, you know, they've been cu cutting off the cross ice pass with Matthews and Marner on the first power play. So they have to really adjust their tactics a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that right now the difference between this team making the playoffs and having a chance in the first round or making the playoffs and having a good chance of advancing is what Kyle Dubas does between now and February 25th. Uh, you know, again, I don't know if they need to really address the fourth line externally. They probably, they can, they can upgrade it with the promotion of guys like Trevor Moore and getting sure. Ennis back. Maybe they could use a fourth line center because I don't think Lindholm or G Gautier, I can't see Babcock using them more than four or five minutes in a playoff scenario. So they may have to go down that road again, but, if you look at the defense, the one encouraging thing about Saturday was Babcock used Travis Dermott almost as much as Morgan Riley, and he moved up into the top four when they were down three to two. I, I am all in favor of more Travis Dermott and less Nikita Zaitsev and Jake Gardner because they, in fact, cost them that game. How would Colton Pareko look on this team right now? How would he transform it? Well, ironically, it's because I've been investigating that and talking to people that I know um, who are in press boxes around the league. And um, there's a general consensus that Pareko is having problems in St. Louis. He's just he's sort of taken a step back and he's on a long term contract. He's making five and a half million a year. And you look at, you know, he's a right hand shot defenseman. He's big. Um, you know, he sort of clicks the boxes in terms of what the Leafs need. But um, I had somebody who observed him in a recent game said he's not playing defense really well. He's sort of not the guy he was a couple years ago when he was playing in the World Cup of Hockey. So that may be the reason why his name is being floated. If, I, if I'm going after somebody on St. Louis and I'm spending the assets necessary to get a top four defenseman, I'm going after Alex Pietrangelo because he's a difference maker. I'm not sure that Pareko is as much a difference maker as we have thought in the past. The Leafs are going to have to part with assets, players, personalities that a lot of young fans especially like. Say we made a deal for Alex Pietrangelo. Who would the Leafs have to send to St. Louis? I wrote about this earlier uh, or late last week, and I'm going to re refer to the chart that I sort of put together in terms of levels of prospects, A level, B level, C level. And, you know, if you look at the Ryan McDonough deal that was made last year, just before the deadline by Tampa Bay, they gave up an A prospect in uh, Brett Howden, a first round pick and a, another like B or C prospect in Hajek for McDonough, who had a year left in his contract, and, and McDonough was 28 at the time. Peter Angelo is 28. I think he's a better defenseman than McDonough, but you know he's a right-hand shot like McDonough is. Um, it would probably cost two A prospects and a, a lesser prospect or draft pick. And if you put that out there and compare it to what the Leafs have, that means probably a Timothy Liljegren, a first-round pick, and another prospect. 
And I think that it could go up a little more than that because I'm sure there would be more than one team that would be interested in Alex Pitarangelo. But and and again, we don't know whether St. Louis wants to trade him or if they do want to trade him, the reason why they want to trade him. They may not want to spend eight million dollars a year on a contract extension because his deal is up after the end of next year. That those are all factors, but it's probably going to cost the Leafs that kind of you know that kind of cost for a player of the quality of Pitarangelo, you're not going to get a top four defenseman for nothing. And people who say, oh, I'm not giving up Caspery Kapanen, and I'm not giving up uh, Andreas Janssen, you have to give up something to get something. And this team has proven that if they don't upgrade their defense, they're going nowhere. I guess it doesn't matter what we think about the Leafs' chances in a Stanley Cup tournament. It depends what Kyle Dubas and the Leafs' brass believe at this point. And if they are looking at their timeline for contendership. And they don't think this is the year. And they're also wary of trading away prospects, uh, controllable players. Maybe the team that we see right now, plus a couple of adjustments, will continue on and they go as far as they possibly can, Mike. Well, I mean, the plan B, if they can't get that impact guy like a Pitarangelo, is to upgrade and get somebody of a, a lesser quality, like a like a Tanev, like a Justin Falk. I mean, there, there, there are other options out there. I just know this. If the Leafs don't address the defensive situation and they go into the playoffs with what they have right now and lose in the first round, then it will be addressed in the summer because there will be no other option. You know, it will be it will be the reason why they lose Mm -hmm. if they if they lose, you know, if if they win, if they beat Boston, if they give Tampa a run for their money in the second round, then you can say, okay, they were right. And they're just going to go with their uh, development model and bring Lilia Grin and Sandine in, which I think they're going to do. You know, if they if they don't trade Lilia Grin, they're just going to have the young guys come in on entry level contracts. Dermot will get a bigger role. They'll let Gardner walk in free agency, all these all these different things. But. If they lose and they have a defensive breakdown similar to they did th- that they did in Game Seven against Boston last year, then how many times do you have to be hit over the head with the same thing before you learn the lesson that your defense is just not good enough? The Leafs have a lot of assets, a lot of good stuff. They have an abundance of talent in certain areas, and they lack talent in other areas. How do you take your surplus? and parlay that into addressing your needs. Based on what he has done in this limited window of him being general manager since uh, June, or earlier, just a little earlier than that, I have a lot of confidence in Kyle Dubas. He's a very, he's a very sharp guy. He knows what he's doing. Um, you know, he hasn't, other than the signing of Tavares, and you can't overlook that because there was a whole situation of being able to convince Tavares to come to Toronto, and that was a, that was a, a you know, organizational thing not just Dubas on his own, but, you know, he's made a good signing in terms of Tyler Ennis as a, as a free agent, you know, a guy who just comes in uh, and fills a spot, you know, he, he gets Hutchinson for a fifth round pick. I mean, it's not like he's made big blockbusters. Yes. He will. I think he'll be defined in part by what he does between now and February 25th. But I, you know, the indicators are, you know, he is, he knows what he's doing and he's going to go out and if his, interpretation of the needs of this team is the same as mine, then I think he'll probably go out and get one defenseman, maybe two, depending mm-hmm. on what it costs. But if it's too much of a cost, then he's going to possibly roll the dice and see where it goes. I, I I think this team, like you do, I think this team has a good chance of advancing in the playoffs, but they just need that one big piece to help them along. And if they don't get it, I just don't know whether they have enough Uh, in the areas that they're deficient in to advance. If all 31 teams were playing pond hockey, the Leafs would be right there. If the Leafs' top offensive talent were all clicking on all cylinders and scoring at a monumental pace, then you could say, well, look, you just can't catch up with them. They're too offensively dominant. It's a tough thing uh, managing a team and and getting it to succeed in all aspects of the game. Anything to uh, close out the podcast, Michael? A couple quick things. One, um, the indication from guys like uh, Elliot Friedman and Bob McKenzie out there uh, is that this is going to be a buyer's market, which is good news for the Leafs because if if there are a lot of teams that are going to be sellers, and right now everybody below Carolina in the Eastern Conference will be a seller. 
uh, to a greater or lesser extent. The West is a little packed, a little tighter. Even Arizona is within four points of a playoff spot. So there's going to be, have to be some shaking loose there, but I think teams like Vancouver or, uh, you know, Chicago or Arizona, if they drop back, then they may be sellers as well. So with a little over well, the, I think it's six weeks now until the deadline, there's going to be some sorting out there. Uh, the other thing is I really think that the signing of Trevor Moore, which was done on Sunday, was a another really good proactive move by Kyle Dubas. Like the Callie Rosen signing, it was a one-way deal, a two-year one-way deal. They got them on the cheap. Rosen is playing really well with the Marlies, and he's waiver exempt, so they're keeping him down in the AHL and letting him have another season. But I think both of these guys are going to be on the Leafs next season. You could see a Callie Rosen maybe stepping in on the bottom pairing, maybe getting some second power play time. Um, you know, cause he's a, he's a, got a good shot from the power play. He's a very mobile defenseman. So in a way he would fill some of the void created by Hainsey, some of the uh, responsibilities uh, vacated by Gardner if he leaves in free agency and Trevor Moore, you saw at the end of the year, I saw, I saw with his uh, little stint, uh, six game stint with the Leafs, he's an NHL player and he's scoring, uh, I think he has 19 goals at the Marlies. So bo- I'm fairly confident both of these guys are going to be on the Leafs next year, and they need as many inexpensive players as they can get with the paydays of Marner and Matthews coming up. Fans love them some William Nylander, and rightfully so, but I don't find a lot of fans getting overly excited about Trevor Moore. Even some of our content on the YouTube channel that is focused on Moore doesn't get as much attention doesn't get as many views as, say, something we do on Nylander. Well, one guy's a former first-round pick, eighth overall, has got a name. His father was in the NHL. You know, there's all the – you heard about him for a couple years and then makes his debut and he scored 60 points twice in the league. And the other guy is a free agent from the University of Denver who was from Thousand Oaks, California. But the thing is, Trevor Moore has improved every every year. He was really good for the Marlies in the Calder Cup – playoffs last year he's having a great year this year and he's fast he i think he fits the nhl the way it is so i think he will be a he will be on this team in some capacity uh in trade after training camp next season you look at what tampa's doing right now and what they're 14 points clear of the Mm -hmm. maple leafs i don't know if the leafs management expected the lightning to be as good as assertive as straightforwardly (laughs) dominant as they have been? And would it make sense to get rid of a Kasperi Kapanen or a Timothy Lilligren Mm -hmm. for a player who will improve the Leafs, but not enough for the Leafs to be able to catch up to and overcome the Lightning? We're going to find out uh, Colorado coming up, and then obviously um, the two games in Florida. If the Leafs lose to the Lightning, you'll have people echo the the whole idea that the Leafs just aren't ready for prime time, at least when it comes to Tampa Bay. And if they do beat them, then you're going to have people who say that anything can happen. It it will, it will depend on the price. No, no doubt. It'll depend on who other teams are asking for. I don't think the Leafs are going to gladly trade a Casper Kapanen if it's a rental. That's the thing, whoever they're trading for. And then Dubas has made this very clear. He wants somebody who's got term left in the contract. He's not going to give up young assets Mm -hmm. that are talented that are going to be in the NHL for a guy who's a one-year fix. They want somebody for two or three years, and that's why it'll cost them a little more, but it won't be a temporary fix. It'll be something that they'll be able to use and benefit from for a number of years. Michael, thanks for your time. Thanks, Norman. There you have it. Another Leafs Combo episode is in the books. Was it all that you hoped and dreamed it would be? I certainly hope so, because I want you to come back. Let us know how we're doing at Norman James TLC, at Mike and Buffalo, at Kyle Outridge TLC, or you can just get at me on the YouTube channel inside the YouTube comment section, or use that community platform. We're trying to build it, grow it, expand it. A few listeners are on there and interacting with me, but we want more. I'd also like to talk to anyone who's interested in potential sponsorship with this podcast. I think it would work out well. The Leafs Convo at gmail.com is the way to start the conversation. For Mike Augello, I'm Norman James. We'll talk to you soon. The Leafs Convo is out.